fantastic experience with this uh, foundation. You know, thank you so much, Dr. Ashley. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for inviting me to, uh, one, speak on business expansion and franchising 101. But uh, more importantly, for inviting me to be able to help as a consultant to help grow these small businesses. I think that's one of the big focuses of Feed the Soul. We're very thankful for the opportunity to connect with our initial cohort to help them go through this six month program. But today is about, you know, giving like high level explanation on business expansion and franchising, you know, two of the key points in the growth and development of restaurants. And uh, I've got a lot of experience with it. I'll be looking forward to sharing it with you guys. There will be a, a question and answers session. Well, we have like 15 or 20 minutes for that. My contact information will be on the last slide. So uh, if you guys want to email me, you know, Facebook, Instagram, you know, any of those things, you know, we'll be able to make sure that you're able to connect with me if we're not able to get your questions today. But we'll just kind of kick things off. So uh, once again, my name is Julian Boyd. I'm one of the co-owners of Debo's Wings, which is based out of Memphis, Tennessee, and the president of Boyd Franchising. So just a little bit of background about myself. I came out of Morehouse College in uh, 2012, where I majored in finance, did a minor in economics. Um, after that, I worked for about four years in corporate America at Raytheon Corporation. I lived in Massachusetts. I also lived in the D.C. area. I was in their two-year rotational program for uh, finance. It was a great experience, but I always knew I wanted to get back to my family's business. So um, I had a conversation with my father, and he was like, look, I can teach you how to do everything that I know, but that's not going to help you take the family business to the heights that you uh, want to take it to. So I decided to apply to business school. I got into UNC at uh, Chapel Hill, Keenan Flagler Business School, class of 2018, where I got an MBA. Uh, my concentration was on entrepreneurship as well as family business. You know, I knew I wanted, you know, UNC offered me the opportunity. It was one of the top entrepreneurship schools at the time as well. And it was one of the few schools that had a family business concentration. So the decision wasn't hard. Um, I knew that I always wanted to get back to my family business, Debo's though. So Debo's Wing started in Memphis, Tennessee about Oh, well, over 30 years ago, August 2nd, 1990, started out of a food truck and grew to as many as uh, five locations at one time. And so uh, once we went off to college, my parents consolidated down to those units, to the two units that were we owned the real estate strip centers for, and we just kind of took things off from there. So once I came back into the family business, we've been focused on franchising. And over the last year, I've already brought in four to six franchise partners. We're looking to grow in uh, the Memphis and the C market. We're going to open a franchise there. We'll be opening one in uh, Winter Haven, Florida, um, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, there could be some potential opportunities in Houston, Texas as well. But uh, Detroit, we might end up with a couple of locations there as well as Chicago. And so we're going to grow this thing. Um, kind of my experience for the last couple of years from uh, 2019 to 2021, I served as the vice president of franchise sales and development for the original Hot Dog Factory. Helped them bring in over 25 franchise units. So that was a great experience. But uh, now I'm focused on the family business more than anything. I also partnered with Hattie Marie's Texas Barbecue, which is also based out of Atlanta, and helped them bring in two franchise units for the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So today we're focused on business growth and business expansion. So, I mean, we're going to try to keep this thing as high level as possible, you know, because there's some things that seem simple, but they're a lot more complicated than you think. So first question is, what is business growth? Every business should have the same long-term vision when they're you know, looking down the road and where they want to be a year or two down the line, growth and expansion. But, you know, before you can even get to that point, you have to have success. That's the most important thing. And everybody's definition of success is going to be measured differently, but you got to have success. It doesn't matter if you're a food truck, a restaurant, a food cart, a, a winery, a wine bar, but you have to have structure in your system and you have to have enough success to be able to support an additional unit, that growth, as well as that expansion. So while, you know, the assumption is, wow, if I add additional units to my concept, there's going to be more money than I've ever made before. Well, the more important thing is your response. What that means, is your responsibilities are going to increase as well as your, you know, consistency, your expectation for your clients that helped you get to that growth point are going to expect even more in their locations, regardless if you're in the northern part of your town, the southern, the middle or wherever it is your obligation and responsibilities are gonna increase. Those things increase, then your income and success should also increase as well. You know, you always wanna think of the long-term, but the short-term vision is just as important. You wanna make sure that you have a strong foundation from your, from your brand. And for what that kind of looks like, um, you know, you want to have consistency across the board. You want to have those standard operating procedures. You want to make it as easy 
to replicate your first location for your second location. Otherwise, you wouldn't be growing in the way that you grew. So now let's talk about franchising. So this is the textbook definition of franchising, but the most important thing to take away from this is like you have your business, it's established. You're granting an individual or group, you know, who will serve as your franchise partners is what I like to call them. They'll pay an initial fee to kind of buy the rights, you know, the trademarks and everything else. And they'll be paying you royalties on a, it could be a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis on how you want to, on how they're gonna sell and provide your product. You know, the most important thing about that, this goes back to that franchise business system piece. If you don't have a process that's easy to replicate, then you don't need to be franchising. It's that simple. So the key thing about franchise partners, be it McDonald's, Taco Bell, Debo's, or even the original hot dog factory, once your franchise partner signed that franchise agreement, you're giving them permission to use your branding, your trademarks, and anything else. You know, you're giving them that consistency across the board so that they can help you grow your brand. But one of the most important things with that is that quality control piece, because once you lose and compromise that, that's where that's where you see things go bad. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie The Founder with Ray Kroc, which is like the story of McDonald's. When he first started franchising, the idea was there. The growth and expansion idea was there. But when he started visiting the locations, you know, these big money guys just put a lot of money into their uh, cons and into buying the actual franchise. But they didn't put the time and the effort in to make sure that the food was the same. They started changing processes. The, uh, the locations were dirty. And he ended up taking a lot of those locations back. So it's kind of a, it's great to expand, but the, the tougher thing is once you try to focus, when you focus too much on the growth piece, you can lose yourself the details that got help get you there. That cleanliness, you know, that customer service, that welcoming every customer that comes into the door. Those are the things that you're supposed to instill in your franchise partners as they're going through training. And you can sit and every like quarter or, you know, if it biannually or however often you want to make sure you're staying connected with them and have meetings to where you can keep that consistency. So if it's a, it's a bound agreement, it can be set for a certain amount of time. Most franchise agreements go out to about 10 years. You'll see some that go shorter, but usually they're mostly around that 10 year mark. So now you have a difference. So you have franchising as well as licensing. So licensing is a little bit different. You're giving people, you're giving uh, your licensing partners the right to operate in cooperation with the brand, you're giving them access to the IP, kind of similar to franchising, but they might not be as uh, the contract might not be as strong when it comes to maintaining that company integrity. You'll see a lot of licensing agreements when it comes to partnering with like big companies or stadiums or, uh, you know, sometimes malls, even when it comes to schools, you know, connecting with Aramark or the companies that are over like this, uh, you know, the college campus of uh, the college campus foods. So I think one of the most important things with the licensor, you know, they're paying their royalties and things like that. But. If you have the opportunity, you want to make sure that the contract that your licensed partner is um, signing into has keeps the integrity intact. Because the one thing you don't want is, you know, people are going to Memphis Grizzlies games or Lakers games or wherever, and then they try some of your product and it's not as good as what they're used to. And the first thing they're going to do is go on that social media and tear you up. So that's why the most important thing that goes back to that training that we were talking about before. So the licensor may have a say in how the IP is used, but not how they operate their business. So that's why it goes right back to that quality control thing that we discussed before. So just going right back to it, a licensor will grant a licensee the right to use their IP, but the, you might not get the same support and or training which is kind of tricky because why would you give somebody your license if you don't want them to have the same accountability that you would expect if it was a company owned store, or if it was a franchise or things like that. And so licensees are also not required to follow the step-by-step -step business plan and they can have the option to adopt suggestions, but you really want to make sure that you have a strong enough relationship to where they understand the importance of doing those things of just kind of falling in line and staying with the success that kind of got you there. So these are the most important thing to know. How do you know when your business is ready for growth? So it's gonna start with this. You have to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, well, you gotta swallow your ego. Ask yourself, do you have a strong enough established brand to where you think another location would be beneficial to the company? You know, Because the key is you don't wanna open locations to close locations. That's where things are gonna get the toughest. Because once you start closing locations, people always remember uh, the shortcomings that you'll have in business, but they won't always remember the success. So that's why it's, if, 
pay, it, it's very important that you make sure that you're established enough. You have a strong enough following. For example, Debo's, we started out of a food truck. We survived off of word of mouth for the first year. And then after that first year, we were able to get our first brick and mortar location. And then, you know, we just kept with that same process, just the same thing that got us there. We didn't change anything. And that's how we were able to build our, build upon our success. Slutty Vegan is another concept that you've seen based out of Atlanta a few years ago. And, she, and uh, Pinky is just taking off with that. It's just fantastic to see everything that she's been able to accomplish. But she had a strong established brand. Um, high quality customer service. This is the thing that's going to set a lot of brands apart because, you know, it's as simple as, you know, greeting people when they come inside, you know, and tell saying that we're looking forward to see you next time. Like those little things when it comes to customer service, customers will always remember that. Those are things that stick with them. Think of Chick-fil-A. It's one of the things that we mandated Devo's as well is like, listen, you have to greet every customer. It doesn't matter if they're at the pickup window or if they're walking in and they're having a bad day because you can be the one that changes their whole day around. And that's how you're going to leave a lasting impact. And that customer will always come back because you show you show them kindness and you took care of them. Um, after that, we have our standard operating procedures. Copy paste. Can your brand, can your concept be easily replicated? Have you documented your standard operating procedures? If you have, do you have a manual that if you were to be able to bring, somebody wanted to come in and buy into your business, would you be able to have a manual that's constructed to walk them through everything from A to Z, how to run the front of the house and how to run the back of the house? If you don't have that, that means you're not really ready for this uh, growth opportunity yet. A strong management team is probably one of the most important things that you can have. And the reason I say that is because if you're growing with multiple locations, you can only be in so many places at a time. That's when you have to implement, you know, you have to implement leaders, you know, that could be outsourcing from uh, other established businesses and bringing in people, or you can have people that have come in from the ground up and over time, they've shown you that they've earned enough, you know, respect and experience in the company to be able to take on the responsibility of becoming a manager or a lead as we like to call them. You know, those are the people that are going to help you build your brand out. And eventually those those uh, leaders should become, you know, general managers, assistant managers in your region that you're looking to grow. And that way you can start focusing on uh, other things, adding different locations, rebuilding, fine tooling things. The next thing that I want to discuss is marketing and your advertising plan, because if you're a strong established brand, that means you've done some kind of marketing. You've got the word out on your brand, be it word of mouth, be it social media be it uh, TV, YouTube, be it however. These are things that are very, very important as you're trying to connect with your customers. Dedication to your craft. It's like, listen, for example, Debo's Wings. We're, we do wings, daiquiris, and seafood. You know, We're not trying to do ribs. We're not trying to do surf and turf and things like that. One of the most important things is staying in your lane and perfecting what you do. You'll see a lot of concepts that'll go out there and try to do a million things. They're trying to wear a million hats. If you just focus on the things that are important to you and you master those things, then that's the thing that's going to help take your business to the next level. And most important, this is the most important thing probably, and it's patience. You know, Rome, that what, what's the old saying? Rome wasn't built in a day. So the most important thing that you can do is have patience. Everything's not going to happen when you want it to happen. You're not going to be able to grow to a thousand units in a year or whatever it is, because one, that's growing too fast. You don't have enough time to learn your customer base and structure your business out and every business isn't made to grow that fast it's not a tech company you know so the one thing that you need to focus on is having the patience to build out your company and make sure that you're ready for that next level so i do want to open things up for uh questions and answers so uh doc i'll defer to you on how you want to go in order with that but uh before i go to the questions and answers i do want to give everybody the opportunity to uh just check out my contact information here. You can email me at uh, julianboyd2012 at gmail.com. Uh, my LinkedIn is here. Uh, my Instagram is at the Jbo Show. Uh, also follow Debo's Wings franchises on Instagram as well as we're looking to grow in these different markets. Check out our modernized website and we should have our uh, Debo's Wings mobile app for iOS and Android coming soon. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, they should be out, but the online ordering platform is already up and running. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in the questions if they come up. So uh, thank you guys so much. But uh, let's get those questions and answers going. Okay. Feel free to unmute yourself. This is a time you guys have a, a nice little um, 20, 30 minutes to ask any questions that you have as it relates to um, franchising and business expansion. You can um, stop sharing, Julian, or stop presenting. Oh, stop presenting. Uh, yeah, you can I have perfect. a question. Um, this is Andre from Philadelphia. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, each 
when you have a franchise, you have to be licensed in each state that the franchise is opening up in. If so, um, do you rec- do you, and, and second question, um, do you recommend what, do you recommend a company to help you put together the, the proper documents needed to start a franchise? Do you have a company that you recommend? Well, yes, actually. So to answer your first question, there are 13 franchise registration states where you do have to register in. It just depends on where you're located and where you're or where you're trying to open. To, uh, for example. So I know for um, um, Georgia, Tennessee, Tennessee and are not franchise registration states, but the state of Illinois is. And so you have to go through the state uh, processes to go through there, get your franchise closure registered. And yes, um, actually, my company does Boyd Franchise and we do help uh, companies that are prepared for franchise and we bring them in. We'll get you connected. We'll help you put together the franchise closure documents. First, we'll make sure you're ready in the place to be able to franchise. And then from there, we'll be able to help you put together all the documents that you need to get ready to be able to franchise. And that's how we kind of go from there. Does that answer your question, Andre? Next question. Next question. Hello. Hi, I have a yeah. question. Um, Jennifer, go ahead. Okay, thank uh, you. Um, do you have you worked with any companies that provide um, franchise leads? Because I know you know franchise consulting or a group of agents that help sell the franchise. But I've also come to learn that there are companies that provide leads. For some of these um, agents, yes, yes, yes. I, I've come across a couple of companies. I've worked a lot of the brands that I've worked with have used some of the lead generating websites. I know like Franchise Direct has been one, Franchise Gator, Franchise Opportunities. But the thing is, when you're dealing with those kind of leads, you know it's kind of a hit or miss. Maybe you get forty leads a month you'll maybe talk to like five people because you have to gauge who's serious about it. Some people might just be mad at their jobs or whatever. And then they're like, okay, I just want to see what's out here. I can run a, a wing place. I can do a chicken place. I can do a hot dog place or wherever. But then of those 10, maybe you're able to find 10, two on a monthly basis that are actually legitimate. But there are some that have a, a more stringent process of uh, helping you find those leads. And I can uh, connect you with one of those as well. I think it's IF, it's the international franchise. I think it's IFCG. I can uh, look up the specific name, but I do have a specific company that's reached out to me in regards to it. And so I can definitely pass on that information. But first, I would like to make sure that you're ready to get in that place. But yes, absolutely. I can help you find and uh, get that set up. Absolutely. And I think next up was Jeffrey. Got a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. I had a quick question. I have a restaurant myself. And uh, we're slowly building up to make sure that we are in the position to franchise. So do you have a specific timeline or how many years that you expect a restaurant to be in operation before you say they are have the green light to be a franchise? Well, that's a great question, Jeffrey. I think the most important thing is, well, that concept has to take a look at itself and see kind of what that measured success looks like. Like, what are your sales number? What do, what's your profit looking like? Like, what's your operation looking like overall? So I think that's kind of a case by case basis, if you will. But, you know, the average time, if you have a built in operation and everything is, let's say, for instance, running on autopilot, your management team is intact, you know, your marketing's together, you've got a strong established brand, then at that point, you might be ready. The next thing is seeing, do you have the finances to support? Can you get a friend? Do you, can you uh, bring in an attorney to get the franchise disclosure document done? I, I'm connected with a couple of attorneys, so I'd be able to help you do those things, get all those knickknacks taken care of. If you live in a state where you have to be registered, now we have to go through the process of that. Sometimes that can take three months within itself. But then after all of those things are done, that's when we can focus on the next step, connecting with the lead generating websites, or sometimes you'll have organic traffic. Sometimes once you start to market the fact that you are franchising, different uh, customers will come in and be like, look, I've, I've got some capital. I've got a little bit of restaurant experience. I love your brand. It's one that I believe in. So what do I have to do to look into franchising? We get a lot of franchise partners going about that way on our side. That answers your question, Jeff. Um, I think next up was Taco Pete, A. Jones. You should unmute yourself. Did you say Aaron? 
Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, how you doing? Um, again, my name is Aaron. Um, I'm wondering what is a decent, I guess, uh, startup fee for the franchise. I've heard anywhere from 35000 to 100000 And then, you know, them taking a portion of your um, franchise fees, um, like 20% of your uh, every franchisee that comes in. Is, is that is there is there and and is there ways to go about it where you can kind of I guess maybe like you said get your lawyer yourself do your own franchise documents to them and it be a little bit more economical as opposed to just going to a, you know place like yeah. that. That's yeah, absolutely. Aaron, I'm, I'm glad you you brought that up. Yeah, a lot of places will tax those. You know, so things can get costly. Um, I know with my company, you know, we try to do things for significantly, you know, cheaper and you're going to get the high quality because our thing is I'm not trying to box out small businesses like my passion is helping small businesses grow. So the most important thing for that is how can we make things more affordable? Getting a franchise disclosure document together can cost anywhere between thirty five to, you know, forty, forty, forty thousand dollars. You know, I know we got our initial one taken care of. It was a forty thousand dollar one and it wasn't even a good one. And then when I went back and got it redone, it was significantly cheaper. And so like with my company, what we try to do, we try to make things a lot more affordable, probably somewhere around $15,000. And that way we'll go through and your entire business practice, you know, we'll give you an itemized, we'll do a questionnaire, get everything lined up and put the whole franchise disclosure document together with you. We'll go through it with you step by step, learn as much about your business and go from there. But yeah, ours is somewhere around 15,000. And then from there, we're going to try to give you the support that you need to, you know, that'll help you get things going from there. And when it comes to taking royalties of your franchise partners, we don't want anything to do with that. Some um, brokers, some franchise brokers will uh, want a percentage of, uh, you know, the franchise fee and things like that. But I think your royalties should be your royalties. You shouldn't be splitting your royalties with anybody unless they're signing in as like an area rep, which is like a, a area developer. Somebody wants to come in, buy the rights uh, for a market for your franchise. Say somebody comes to Atlanta, wants to buy your concept and they want to open 10 stores and sign on as an area rep deal where you would, um, you know, that you'd split the franchise fees with them on the stores they bring in as well as the royalties. That's the only situation where I believe that you should be sharing your royalties. Uh, outside of that, no, your royalty should be yours, but franchise fees are where like brokers uh, and consultants can expect to be paid from, if that makes sense. Does that kind of make sense, Aaron? Yeah, it does. I appreciate you so much. And then I, I need your contact information as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So I'll uh, I'll make sure. Uh, Ashley, can we make sure I uh, we get I get connected with uh, Aaron? Yes, I'll, I'm going to post awesome. your contact information in the, in the chat right now. Awesome, um, awesome. Okay. My next question, you guys, this is a perfect time to ask any questions you have. So feel free to unmute and ask away. Yeah, please fire them off. I'm trying to give as much knowledge as possible here, guys add some more clarification for you guys as well because we want to make sure everybody who's interested in growth we got you down the right path and if you're not ready now then our job as uh the consultants at feed the soul is to get you there miss james and i didn't have a question i had more so a, a comment and uh i don't know as much about franchises but i i have a lot of franchise competitors so i talk with and i'm always friends with my competitors i'm in the senior care industry it's heavily mm -hmm. franchised mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I talk with a lot of my competitors all the time. So what I've heard is once you get ready to that, that point to do franchising, then you pretty much get in the franchising business. So you really, and some of the things you were saying, Julian, is very, very important. You really want to focus on the quality because yes. not everyone will do the franchise the way you would do the franchise. And then also supporting. One of the things that I hear so much from my competitors is that they don't feel like they have the support from the franchise or so you really want to make sure that yeah it's great and you can make a lot of money by doing it but you want to make sure that you really have your process and things set up accordingly so that you can provide that support um, down the line to be successful miss james you're right on the money with that because uh, that's one of the biggest things if you don't have the support 
you have to have a team. Like I, I don't wear every hat as I'm doing this thing. I just oversee a lot of things. I have a chief marketing officer. I have a chief technology officer. Like, you know, uh, when it comes to these different things, even when it comes to finance, I might outsource. When it comes to legal, I need support. There are a lot of things that I do know and that I have learned while I've been doing these things. And it's co a constantly learning thing. But the first thing to know is you can't wear every hat. You can't do it on your own. If you can't support your franchise partner, then you don't need to be doing it. That's six percent, like a six percent save your royalties or six percent. That's what ours is at Devo's. Six percent of zero is still zero. If that store closes or things go bad, then you're not making any money. And you might have made a little bit of money, but now your brand is taking a hit because you know you've compromised because you're not being able to support your uh, franchise partners the way that you're supposed to have. We have another question from Jennifer from LaBerry's Bakery and Donuts. Yeah, I would have you all to myself if I could. I have tons of questions for you. <laughs> no, keep firing them off. Keep firing them off. Keep okay. firing them off. Um, so we've already submitted the FDD and the FA to California. So that covers many states mm -hmm. except 13 that you mentioned. And so we're thinking in terms of growth at this point. Um, you know, we have all these states that we can grow, and we've had, you know, interest from New York and several other states, but we're only a single store right now. And my mm -hmm. partner and I, although I'm sure my partner can do this, um, how, what do you recommend in terms of how to grow? Should we start just regionally, locally, and then expand? Because we want to make sure every franchisee is successful. Yes. I think the most important thing is to start regionally, right? Because you want to make sure like, what part of uh, California are you guys in? Pasadena, so in LA. Okay, so pass it in LA. You want to make sure that you can at least get to your franchise partners if you need them or if they need you really quickly, right? Like you don't have to necessarily lock your rent to just California, but if you want to be a quick, a quick plane ride or a quick uh, four-hour car ride to make it work, then you want to be able to support them. So I would always start off regionally, trying to grow and take over that region, and then you can kind of focus on that uh, those other places because. As you're going to start growing, those franchise partners will show you that they're able to take care of things on their own because you're going to want to be super hands on with them at first. And, you know, and I always explain to franchise partners that I'm bringing in, like, listen, this isn't a hands off thing. You got to kind of have that mindset. You got to be there pretty much every day, at least for the first six months, because otherwise it's going to tank. And so and once if you're running your business the way that you're running it and that thing is on autopilot, at that point, that's when you can start focusing on your next location or whatever it is they want to do or things like that. We also require, and I'm sure you might know this already, if you're signing a multi-unit franchise deal, say it's for a three-store deal or whatever, you don't open three stores simultaneously. You open that first one and then they have a year to open the next one and then the next one. That way, nobody's taking on too much. But to answer your question, I would start off regionally and go from there. Thank you. And we please keep the questions coming. Please keep the yeah, questions coming. Yeah, feel free. We have a question from uh, Tiffany. Go ahead, Tiffany. How, hello, Julian. How are you? I'm doing great, I have Tiffany. A question. I'm currently in a franchise. So do you have um, any experience with helping individuals get out of a franchise? I mean, I heard somebody mention about support, and that's one of my biggest things. You know, we went through the whole pandemic and i never heard anything from my franchise owners or you know have been offered any support or anything um, from them to keep my franchise going i've had to pivot and kind of create some things on the side to keep going do you have any experience or know of anyone having experience to helping individuals getting from under a franchise well, the most important thing is taking uh, you'd want to have an attorney, any kind of franchise attorney. I would have them take a look at your franchise agreement. It's usually a 10 year agreement. You can figure out if they violated any of the terms that you guys kind of agreed to, because as your franchise or you're supposed to give your uh, franchise partners consistent support across the board, especially in a pandemic. I heard a lot of people from one brand whose name I'm not going to say is uh, they did not receive the support that they needed. And the company's also talking about selling. And so like this guy was like, yeah, I've been with this company for like 15 plus years. This guy was in Michigan, said he was with this concept for like 15 plus years. And throughout the whole pandemic, they couldn't get they couldn't reach the leadership team for a year. This is like a billion dollar business. This is one of the big franchises. And so, you know, that guy was looking to sell all four of his locations. So the most important thing that I would look for is uh, I'd reach out to a franchise attorney. I have one in mind that uh, I could connect you with. 
uh, if you needed one. But um, definitely we want to look into a franchise attorney, see if they can take a look at your franchise um, agreement. And either you can see if you can break it or if you could sell the business, sell that franchise altogether. And I think those are uh, the two most important options that I would look into if I was in that situation. Does that kind of help, Tiffany? Uh, yes, sir. And I, I was just wondering, like, if you have the office space and you don't renew um, your lease, are you still tied to your franchisee in that way? Yes, yes. You are still locked into your franchise agreement, if, even if you don't have the location. So you usually ideally want to sign your lease to be the same um, length. If you sign a 10-year lease, you want it to be a 10-year franchise agreement. But some sometimes you sign a five-year uh, lease and because sometimes the price will be better. But then the landlord will try to upcharge you on those back-end five years. But yeah, you're still locked in. So even if you move that location to another location, you're still uh, locked in for the, the however long that franchise agreement is, the five years, 10 years or whatever it was that you initially locked into. But if your franchise partners aren't giving you, if your franchisor isn't giving you the support that uh, you've been needed and you've constantly tried to reach out, then I would definitely have an attorney take a look at that, uh, that agreement. Thank you. Can I just have a comment for that? Because I kind of went through this early in my career food business. Um, mm -hmm. Try mediation rather than litigation. It will be, it will say, if you need to go that far, obviously, um, it will save you a lot more money in the long run, um, even if things go your way to get out. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Sure okay. Um, so when it comes to area protection, what is your recommendation in terms of how wide that mile should be? Five, 10, 15, 20, for, for each, per location, per franchise? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we do seven. So at Debo's, uh, at Debo's wings, we do seven miles because we don't want to have locations stacked on top of each other. We're not trying to be McDonald's or Subway where you have like a store a, a, a mile from each other or even Starbucks where you have some like 10 blocks from each other, you know? So the big thing for us is the reason I always say seven miles is I believe that's far enough away to where you won't cannibalize each other's sales. You won't affect each other because now you're attracting a different market. Now you can make some, um, a, a, you make some adjustments to that. So like we're working on an area rep deal for the Atlanta market, right? And so the key thing that we're looking at now is where do we want to have locations? If we open up in one part of the city, we want to make sure that everybody's able to thrive. But you, if you're going to be in the stadium, then that shouldn't affect, like, that's a different market than, like, you know, in a location that's going to be a brick and mortar location that's down the street because stadiums are only open for, like, you know, games and events and things like that. So those shouldn't affect one another sale, one another sales. But um, I would always say seven miles. Five, I, you see some places that say five miles. I say seven to be safe because that gives you time to attract an entirely different client coming from a different part that they may be driving or walking or anything like that. And so Julian, just quickly for the people who don't know, can you um, describe, define what area, um, what that term was, area protection? I kind of, I understand, oh, uh, but just so people who oh, don't know. The area, oh, the area, uh, okay. So the area yeah. developer piece, okay. So that was something that we can go over now. So, you, so with franchise, you have a couple of different types of deals, right? So you have a single, say if you're uh, trying to sell a single unit, right? So that's one unit, clearly. And so that would be an X franchise fee at X amount of royalties, right? If you're doing a multi-unit, maybe save your, for us, our franchise fee is 30,000. But if it's a multi-unit deal, maybe you'd want to give a discount, like, you know, three for 60,000 or something like that. Because it's three over three years or less, you know, but you always want to do three over three years, three to five. Um, if you're going to do... Um, a master franchise deal where they just want to open like 10 stores, you know, at that point at, you know, that could be at whatever the, the number that you guys determine is like good for your market, because, you know, your, your brand is valued at a certain amount. You know, what if your franchise fee is 30,000, say you do 10, so maybe that's a $300,000 uh, deal. But if you're new to it, you definitely want to discount it. Like you want to make sure, cause you want to focus on growth. You're not focused on the franchise fee payout. You're thinking the long-term value of your company and how much this thing's going to be worth once you add 10 additional units. You know what I mean? Especially if you have a successful company. So then, um, and uh, so we call that a master franchise deal. Then you have your area developer deal where you're pretty much creating a mini version of yourself. So it's like this person is going to take on like the responsibilities of growing the franchise to say if they wanted to, uh, they bought the territorial rights for LaBerry Bakery and Donuts for, uh, let's say, Sacramento. 
let's say Sacramento. So like, you know, Sacramento is a big area. They want to do a 10 store deal for that. So the way that they would uh, do that is, okay, I'm going to open X amount of stores over 10 years, but I'm going to help you push, promote the franchise. I'm going to help you with the marketing. Like they're taking on some of the responsibilities that you would take on as an owner. And in that place, so they're like a mini version of you, as I stated before, but they also get uh, 50% of the franchise fees on the stores that they're going to open as well as 50% on the royalties of the stores that they open in their or stores that are opened in their market. And so you'll see a lot of uh, concepts do this, this one franchise concept, not going to say their name. They did, they did it kind of that route and they went too hard because they were focused too much on the growth of numbers. And you, you'll see a lot of their stores shutting down uh, a lot, like across the board, especially the last few years. And like 10 years ago, they were the highest rated franchise out there probably. And now, you know, you kind of see them uh, closing stores left and right. So does that kind of answer you, uh, the question, Ashley? Yeah, so I, that kind of does. I was speaking about how you guys were mentioning like the five mile, seven mile. Oh, um, oh absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so what we call, uh, 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 we call that a, a mile radius, right? So the way that we look at that, you'd wanna, you don't wanna cannibalize your stores. You don't wanna have two stores that are too close. Like you'll have a, two McDonald's that are very close to each other that are probably cannibalizing each other's sales. So you're taking sales away from each other. So every each store isn't thriving or getting the support that it might be getting if it was just the only one there, right? You know, from an, uh, from the company perspective, they're happy to have that many stores and they still get the royalties at the end of the day. But if you do that, you're gonna have a lot of angry franchise partners because you're stacking stores on top of each other. So you always wanna have stores far enough away to where each one can thrive on its own. Perfect, thank you so much. And then Shannon has a question. Make sure to unmute yourself, Shannon. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. All right, great. So my question comes with like a, it's more, I guess, a supply chain question. The issue that I have had, um, I've been in business for six years. I have two locations um, and People have expressed interest in uh, franchising my or licensing my uh, business in other areas. And the issue that I have is that a lot of the ingredients I use, are like, a, like for my beef, it's a special blend that everyone can't make um, mm -hmm. or can't get. And that's been like the major roadblock in me expanding outside of my area because I don't know if I'll be able to get the same product um in those different areas so that's that's has been my issue i was wondering if you had any suggestions absolutely what i would go is um when as you're looking for growth and you're looking for expansion one of the most important things that you have to look for is like outside manufacturing you're not going to be able to make everything in-house if you're looking to grow you know so and so i think um i'm not sure how it works with beef but i know with like some food products you can find food production companies that, you know, they'll sign an agreement, a non-disclosure where they can't share any of your recipes or any of your processes, and they can help you uh, blend or make whatever it is that you're trying to make. I'm not sure how it works for meat exactly, but I think that's the best way that I would go about it from a supplier standpoint. Look at the, uh, to different food manufacturing companies that, you know, maybe some food processing, meat processing places that'll like, I, I would look into, just do some research out there to see what the small businesses are looking like, maybe even some of the larger ones. But uh, I think that'll be the best way to get that supply chain uh, issue solved. I got a, a comment. You know, make sure that everybody that goes to him, uh, he has a, he gets like a rebate for them using his meat. Like he makes the meat 500 pounds, 10, you know, 1,000 pounds, whatever for a week. But they have to come specifically for him uh, to use his product as part of his franchise agreement and then that way he even gets a extra um, a fee on top of that for them to, uh, to be delivering the meat did you get that shannon and we'll connect aaron and shannon just so they can talk offline about that one. i think that's some uh really good insight on like if they are going to start franchising and growing and using your company and your brand as a a way to uh you know grow theirs i think you definitely want to make sure that the paperwork is tight on that just to make sure there's no uh gaps in that to where you know they're selling it out the back of the house or something like that 
Yeah, my my issue is like I don't I don't grind my meat. I have someone who does it for me out here mm-hmm. in Texas. But like one of the opportunities I had was in Atlanta, and there wasn't anyone in Atlanta I could find or anywhere in that area that I could find. Now I didn't check the smaller mom and pops like butcher shops and things like that, but the bigger mm-hmm. companies could be willing to take on. Like everyone has their blend. Those, they may have ten different blends, but it's, mm-hmm. you can choose from those ten. Um, there's very few people who are who want to get into the market of doing a custom blend for you, or if they do, they have extremely high volume uh, demands. Which is fine, which is understandable because if they're going to take that on, then it has to make sense. So I, yeah. I, I see both sides of that, but my thing is I'd reach out to the mom and pop butcher shops and see what that kind of situation is looking like because there's always going to be a lot more opportunity with the smaller businesses as opposed to like the larger ones. The larger ones are going to be, you know, bossier because they've got their established footprint and things like that. What I've seen in my, uh, in the past, it's easier to partner with uh, smaller brands uh, because they, it's going to sound crazy, but they care. You know what I mean? I know that sounds crazy, but the smaller brands always care more than the bigger businesses, especially because if they're, if they're forward thinking, if you line the plan out the right way, it's a, it should be a mutually beneficial situation that everybody thrives in. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they can build their brand by doing this. And once your company grows, they still need to use you. They, they, you still need to use them to grow, you know? And so if they have that, uh, that's the kind of way that I would kind of drive that conversation with them. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes. Hi there. Hey. Again. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, okay, keep on them off. That's great. what today is about. Yes, that's okay. what today is about. So I, I have three questions, but I'll let other people take. I'll take one question aside. Um, first was you. You mentioned earlier we were to um, find a consulting um, franchise company. What was the percentage initial fee that's usually they they would take? Is it fifty percent or seventy five percent? I forget theirs. I know with a lot of different companies, it can be high, but I would negotiate. Like if I'm going to connect with one of those, like IFCG, I can't think of their exact name. I'm going to find it for you though. Cause they email me all the time. Um, They're I would the largest tell them one, right. And they got several wars in the last two years for franchise. Yeah. They're one, they're one of the larger ones. I would just do some research on the smaller ones. Um, Cause there's a lot of ways to go about it. You can like debt it. You can do it yourself and try to lead campaigns on like, you know, um, what is it? One franchise opportunities. That could be one that I've seen work before. It's all going to depend. I, I've seen brands use that one. Like you probably pay like maybe 800 to to $1,000 a month to generate leads, depending on what your profile is. Like if you think like the startup costs, like a franchise partner, we need somewhere around 100000 or more to start up, then you can like categorize yourself off like, listen, we're not even trying to get leads from people that don't have X amount of dollars. But the thing is, you don't know if they actually have that money or not until you start to talk to them and do all of those kind of things. But uh, the key thing is, once you do that, you're probably spending a thousand dollars a month or somewhere like that, just in the franchise marketing piece. You can promote on the Instagram, on the Facebooks that you're trying to do this with the targeted ads and demographics, Um, reaching out to the franchise magazines and doing things like that. That could be another way to get word out because a lot of these places are looking uh, for small brands to partner with. The hardest thing is just finding these people. And so um, I'm not sure what their fee structure is. It might be 50% per uh, of the franchise fee, depending on what that is. And maybe in that situation, you can increase your franchise fee if you're using that, you know, if you're going to use that platform. But at the end of the day, uh, remember the franchise fee is just to get the door open. Like that's, you know, your your goal is to get units open. But the one th- conversation that I, I've had with them before, because they reached out to me in regards to doing it. The reason I put it off is because, like, I do a lot of those things on my own right now. But my big thing is if I'm going to do that, the return on investment has to make sense. I'm not just trying to throw you a thousand dollars a month. I'm in this portal and doing things. and I'm not getting any high quality leads where I'm actually getting traffic from. If you want 50 percent of my stuff, if you want 50% of my franchise, so you got to earn it. It's not just like spitballing and, oh, I have these people. These need to be people you know that have their finances together. They need to have their entire, uh, they need, maybe if you require business uh, restaurant experience, they need to have that. They need to be profiled in the right way. Like you're not just going to save your franchise fees 30000 You're not just going to get 15000 just because you made something happen. This needs to be a high quality person. I'm going to pay you a portion of my hard earned money and, you know, quote, comprom- expect, like compromise my brand to do this. Then at that point, you got to earn it. 
You know, that's the way I look at it. And I always tell them, I'm a startup. I'm just getting started. I don't have that much money. I'm sorry. You know, even if, that, even if I have this, I'm a startup. I'm new. This franchising thing is new. I'm not comfortable paying people 15000 per deal. Can we move up to that? Can you give me some proof of concept? Like maybe we can start off at 25 for the first couple. And then like, you know, now that we've gotten to five, now we can go to this, you know, like negotiate those things. And remember, you have the power in this and they want your business just like you want to grow. And if they're not willing to meet you there, then tell them to, tell them to get lost. That's, that's the way I look at it, though. I'll email you for some of the smaller franchise companies. Then. <laughs> absolutely. 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 All right, we got any other ones? Yeah, fire them off. Oh, go for it. You got your next one? Go right ahead. I remember you said you had three. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the next one was, I, I know that you mentioned earlier IFCG. I know they're a global. They're one of the largest one. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any comment about global expansion? Like how um, that would work and stuff? If you have the support, right? And it's all about establishing yourself. Like, so I worked at a, I, I left this out. So I worked at Pizza Hut on their franchise finance team. I interned there for in, uh, the summer of 2017. I learned a lot, got to see a lot. And that's when KFC started doing KFC China, which is a whole nother sector of the company because like over there, they love KFC, whole nother market over there. So it's so big, they had to create a whole new KFC China business for that. And so once again, it goes to that support piece. Once you've established yourself and you have a good enough rapport if you have a strong enough support team that's overseas somewhere be it europe asia or wherever then at that point take advantage of that opportunity well i'm not sure what the franchise laws are uh you know or licensing laws are over there so that's something that you would definitely want to look into or have an attorney look into but if that opportunity is there then and you can get the support there once again going back to that quality control piece that we discussed earlier then that should put you in a great, great position to be able to take advantage of it if it's there you know why not I say you go ahead and fire off number three if you can. Okay, we will do. Go for um, it. So in the FDD that we submitted, um, mm -hmm. there were three different structures that we envisioned. One is an actual bakery and donut shop like we have our, mm -hmm. with our launch, with our first one. Another one would be more of a non-production unit. So for example, if it goes in the mall, if it goes at the airport, because the space is not gonna be that big. But in order to be able to do these non-production unit, we have to have a production unit that would actually make some of this and then be able to provide that. But we put the production unit in the franchise FDD because we want to find franchisees for it. And I was speaking to someone who specialized in franchise and he said that's a competing uh interest <laughs> with the shop and i said not really they're supplying <laughs> for yeah exactly shop. yeah one and but but the other piece i wanted to do with the production unit the manufacturing facility was actually um provide as wholesale because we've gotten interest from costco and trader joe but we can't even supply to their thousand stores <laughs> or a single store exactly. and so that's why we created this what are your thoughts on this so it's funny. I uh, I had I had a guy that was uh, that's looking to grow a concept of uh, I think they're like food carts, if you will, right? And so they have a commissary that they use to support. So it's like a franchise partner comes in, they buy seven of these food carts or whatever. I think it was like for thirty five thousand or something like that. But they have to have a commissary to support it, kind of like a ghost kitchen, if you will, to kind of support it. It's not competing. It's the way of the future. <laughs> you know, like that's just how it is. So it's just like, and if anything, it saves you on overhead costs. So if somebody wants to do a food, for instance, if somebody wants to do a food truck concept with Devos, right, which is one of the things that we are offering, you have to have a brick and mortar to support it. You know what I mean? Because you're going to do volume. You have to plan that you're going to do volume and you have to be able to plan ahead. And so the thing is, well, how do you get to that point? You can't just have a truck and just drive around because you're going to maybe have like, what, four cases of chicken in that one refrigerator. Man, we do like sometimes 80 to 100 cases on a weekly basis. So what kind of volume are you really expecting? Especially if you have this food truck, you just wanna try and do a lunch surge or things like that. But the real opportunity is, I mean, it's not a commissary, it's a manufacturing place. And so one thing that I would think about doing is looking for partnerships, maybe connecting with uh, already established bakeries that, that are in the nearby region to connect with that. Like if somebody wanna do in the LA airport, maybe there's like a, 
um, a, a nearby bakery or somebody that would want to support this. They'll take this on. They'll have, they'll be like, oh, well, we'll do this for you. We'll crank this out for you. Like we're still running our business, but this can be our quote side business. You know, as you know, even if it's a quote competing business, if you guys sign into some kind of partnership agreement together, then that's kind of how I would think about building that out and doing that. Because uh, I mean, why not? Once again, it's the opportunity for that business to grow and for yours to thrive. Because you can't be in a hundred places at once. But uh, so that's kind of the way that I would think about doing it. That's just me kind of pulling one together. But yeah, I would just use somebody else's business to do that. Well, I'll, I'll respond to him by saying, this is the wave of the future. <laughs> it's the wave of the future. It is. It's like, okay. listen, you got to have, like, you want your business to be supported. You know what I mean? So, and if they can't build that out in the airport or at the college or at the mall or wherever, they got to get the food from somewhere and they want it fr as fresh as possible. So it's got to be made somewhere. So either you're using your business or using somebody else's. And that's the best way to go about it, that I think at least. Okay. All right, if we don't have any other questions, we can take one final one before we wrap up. Um, I put Julian's information, uh, Robin, perfect, there you go. Um, Robin, give me one second. I've also put Julian's information in the chat, so be sure to take a look at that and get his email and his LinkedIn and also his Instagram. And Robin, with the final question. Hey, this is Zach, um, Robin's husband. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we on Local Green Atlanta. And um, how you doing, Julian, man? Got a lot of great, great information from you today, man. Um, uh -huh. I wanted to ask though, like, is is there any, um, is there any data that you put into what what data do you use as far as knowing what's the next area that you want to expand or franchise in, franchise to? Is this um any particular like data research that you do on your current customer? Like, how do you how do you determine what what areas of opportunity that you should be looking into? That's a great question. For Devos, I just go where the interest is. I mean, everybody loves what it is that we do. So I just kind of follow that. And so a lot of the franchise partners that I've brought in, they've happened through organic relationships that I've built over the years. And so, but my thing is, where do you see, so even before we even looking at franchising or whatever, where's somewhere that you would want to open up shop to, uh, that you would see your business successful in? Is it a more suburban part of town? Is it in a more like, you know, is it deep in the heart of the city? Is it uh, just, you gotta figure that out. And so once you figure out your target market, what's the average median income there? Like, would people be able to buy this and or afford this food, these products, this wine, or whatever your product is, would we have success here? If we've had proof of success in this market, this is fine. What about this market? How can we test that out? Are we getting customers? Are we getting employees from, uh, not employees, are we getting customers coming from all over town coming to us? If say for instance, if you're in uh, your, your operations in East Point, uh, Georgia. Yeah, I'm sure you know where East Point is. It's closer to the airport, south, kind of South Atlanta, right? So, I, there we go. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Outcast. <laughs> shout out, shout out to Outcast, of course. You know. So, uh, so the most important thing I'm looking at: Do we have people driving all the way from Buckhead, from East Atlanta, from West Atlanta, all the way to us? If they are, then what if we found an opportunity there? Let's see what these markets are looking like. Where's the next growth wave going to come from? Where are these big developments going to be next? You see, they're redoing downtown Atlanta. So my thing is like, it's kind of tracking up. So I keep up with what's going on in my local market uh, in Atlanta. I keep in contact with what, I keep up with what's going on in Memphis and Florida, where all my franchise partners are. I keep up with what's going on, what new restaurants are coming and what part of town are they looking at going into? And just, I just kind of build things out from there. And that's why I'm kind of able to pinpoint where it is that I want to go next. Uh, but everything else just kind of happens organically. As people like come in and they're interested and uh, growth or franchising, I tell them, I ask them where they live. It might be as simple as asking your customers what part of town are they coming from, actually, and just kind of making a mental log and just kind of marking it down from there. Like, okay, this person came from this part. This person came from this part. This part of town would be super, super, super pricey to open up in, but this part of town may not be. So what's kind of the midway point? Maybe I don't want to go to the suburbs to do this. Maybe I still want to be able to take advantage of the metropolitan life. It's all, it's a... Uh, it's, it's a case by case thing, but I think it would start by getting some more data on your customers, just figuring out where do you guys live? What are the kind of things that you're into like to eat and just kind of go from there. Right. It's, it's something called, um, I mean, it's something, you know, they, they do call cloning your customer, you know, where you kind of uh -huh. get to know more about your customer, like their behaviors and things like that. Like, you know, I was really trying to, um, I guess, get some 
information around that because you know I'm, I'm at that point now where i feel like I'm, I'm i know i'm ready to expand and um just whether that's corporate stores or franchising i want to be very deliberate and intentional about you know where we go absolutely let's uh make sure you get my contact information and let me see if i can help you figure this thing out man uh, let's make sure you're ready at that point. Let's kind of strategize, brainstorm the way you want to go about it, and we can kind of figure things out from there. Do we have any additional uh, questions, guys? Well, did you have another question? Because I would definitely want to talk to you more about that because I think you might have something there. You're in a you're in a, a tricky spot. Do I? A which way do you want to go? Kind of a fork in the road, road, if you will. I have a question. Um, are we able to get a, a copy of this recording? Because um, I'm driving, and I ain't getting yes. a chance right now. To do yes. it. No problem. Um, this will be available on. Um, we'll say, available if you're in part of a computer, computer. Um, okay, perfect. Um, if you're in the cohort, which I believe that you are, Andre, and um, I think a couple other people that are on here, we'll send you all the direct link to this recording, and also we'll give you guys Julian's information. If you are not a part of our restaurant business development program and you're just watching it right now, you can actually find it on our YouTube page page so feed the soul foundation on youtube you'll find this recording there in about an hour any other any questions other? Guys? Yeah. Okay. Okay. if there are no final questions we want to thank you guys for attending we want to definitely thank julian for all of his information this has been amazing we hope that you guys um leave here with new information on business expansion and franchising and then if you have any more personal, not personal, but if you have any more kind of like confidential questions that you want to ask, please look in the chat, find Julian's email, his LinkedIn and his Instagram. Also the website, which is www.dboswings.com and find out more information about him and his companies. And thank you all. You guys have a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job, Julian. Great job, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.